Hey everyone, I have decided to start covering some of the some of the interesting stories, mysteries, um, things that have unusual things that have happened, um, not only throughout the Smoky Mountains, but throughout Tennessee and actually the southeastern U.S. There are a lot of disappearances, a lot of <clears throat> strange occurrences that have occurred. One of the most popular ones is the one I want to cover today because many people know about the disappearance of Dennis Martin, which is the story I want to cover today. But not everyone is aware that in 2022, the, the FBI released just over 140 pages of information about their investigation into the Dennis Martin case. Um, I've read a lot of accounts of the Dennis Martin disappearance, and uh, most of the accounts have the same type of information, the same details. Um, and then I, I, when I discovered this, all of these files that the FBI had, um, I went to the FBI vault and started just reading through all of these pages. I couldn't stop reading it. It was so interesting. Uh, a lot of details that were not published in most of the stories out there about this disappearance. So I decided I'm going to cover the disappearance, but I'm going to include all of the new information that you can find in the FBI vault, things the FBI discovered or investigated after the disappearance of Dennis Martin. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating story. It's so interesting uh, what the FBI had been looking into that was not public and didn't become public until many, many years later in 2022. So let's get started covering this story now. So what most people know about this story is that Dennis Martin disappeared on June 14, 1969, while he was on an outing with his father and his brother. He was six years old when he disappeared, and his disappearance launched one of the most extensive searches in Smoky Mountain history, with about 1,400 searchers covering about 56 square miles. As the story goes, Dennis Martin was with his father, his grandfather, and his older brother on Father's Day weekend in 1969. They were on a camping trip that they had gone on annually. It was a family tradition. They had hiked from Cades Cove to Russell Field, and camped overnight there. And then the next day they hiked to, to Spence Field, which is a field uh, nearby the Appalachian Trail. And that's where they planned to spend the night. Before they could spend the night, they had met up with other campers, another family there who had children of their own. And Dennis and his brother had spent some time playing with these other children. And at some point in the play, the children decided they were gonna play a prank on the adults they were going to hide out and then creep in the woods close to where the adults were and basically jump out and scare the adults. So all the kids split up. They went in different directions. Some were together. Uh, Dennis Martin, unfortunately, was kind of sent off on his own direction. And the kids carried out their plan, but when they all came out to surprise the adults, Dennis Martin didn't. And that was the last time anyone ever saw Dennis Martin. It was around 4.30 on June 14th when he disappeared. And his father had actually seen him go behind a bush to hide. So his father started conducting a, a search, as most parents would, and ran all the way down the trail for about two miles looking for Dennis Martin. And after about several hours of searching, they eventually decided that he was gone, he was missing, and they contacted the National Park Service Rangers. Search efforts included both the National Guard and the Green Beret, believe it or not. And there were unfortunately heavy rains during the first day of the searching and heavy mist for the following days as well. They found some interesting footprints. Um, one story or the, the common story is that they found a set of footprints. One was basically a footprint with a shoe on. The shoe matched Dennis Martin's shoes. The other foot was barefoot. They assumed that Dennis Martin had lost one of his shoes and that both prints were his. The logic the Rangers used is that none of the Boy Scouts who were helping in the search were barefoot, which was the first unusual comment. It was almost, it was very, it didn't show a whole lot of deep thought or critical thinking because they completely forgot about or didn't think about the fact that the Martin children had been playing with other children before Dennis's disappearance. So the fact that there was a barefoot children's footprint down by the water 
where likely Dennis could have fallen into the water, it's strange they didn't ask the question, were any of the other children they were playing with running around barefoot when that incident occurred? But anyway, that's beside the point, just something I found interesting. Finally, on June 29th, that's how long the search actually happened, uh, the search was called off. The search didn't end on that day, that's just when the active searches were happening. The official stop of the search for Dennis Martin was September 14th of that same year, 1969. And as of 2022, it still remains the most extensive search for a person in Smoky Mountain history. There are a few things in the FBI files that match commonly known information about this disappearance. The fact that the father offered a $5,000 reward, which is almost $40,000 in today's currency. Dennis's father offered a... He also uh, hired on psychics. One in particular, her name was Jean Dixon, looking for information from psychics who may be able to give him some clues on where his son was. The wiki page says nothing was found, which is interesting because the FBI files actually note that the... Uh, psychic had led them to a an artifact of clothing that was found, and I'll get to that in a minute. As of today, there are lots of theories about what happened to Dennis Martin. Uh, one of the craziest ones I've heard is there's a belief that there are feral humans living in the mountains in that area, at least back then, uh, in the 19 late 1960s, and that they had taken, they had abducted Dennis and either you know, cannibalism. Supposedly this group of feral humans living out there are cannibals and they abduct people and supposedly they abducted Dennis and um, who knows what happened to him, if that's true. Another is that because of the heavy rains uh, in that during that time period that he was just swept into the river, swept into the water and washed away or a landslide or something happened with the elements. The elements killed Dennis Martin. That's another theory. Another is that he was attacked by a bear and uh, killed and eaten. Another one, and the one that his father was a proponent of, is that he was just abducted by someone in the area, taken out of the area. I'll tell you, the FBI investigation kind of supports that theory in a way, although they I don't want to give away too many details. They investigated an abduction, potential people who could have abducted Dennis. I don't... Personally, I don't believe the investigation was as thorough as it could have been. They let a lot of the leads die that they probably shouldn't have. Right up until what I've covered so far is the story most people know about the disappearance of Dennis Martin. Now we're going to get into the FBI files, and I think you'll find these very interesting. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to what I'm going to do is talk through some of these files. The... Um, 140 some odd pages of FBI files follow chronologically how the investigation took place. At the beginning, the FBI did not want to get involved. They didn't feel that any federal crime had taken place. The first one, and almost every document in here, the, the way they write their reports, the FBI reports, is they give a summary of the event. So almost every document starts with, Dennis Martin, age seven, has been missing in this Great Smoky Mountains National Park since Saturday, 6-14-69. Dennis, an older brother, blank, William Martin, father of the missing child, the grandfather, and other family members had been on a camping trip in a remote area known as Spence Field. It is to be noted that Spence Field is some four or five miles by mountain trail from the nearest point that can be approached by automobile. The children had been playing when it was discovered that Dennis, age seven, was missing. Since that time, literally thousands of people have participated in a terrain search in an effort to locate... The missing child. This has included Army and Air Force helicopters, National Guard units, regular Army units, and various volunteer groups, all under the direction of Park Service officials. This office has maintained liaison with the National Park Service in order that we be notified immediately in the event that there is an indication of foul play. The area where this occurred is a federal park with at least concurrent federal jurisdiction. To date, however, there has been absolutely no indication of any foul play. And there's no reason whatsoever to believe that this is other than a simple situation of a child of tender years getting separated from his group in a wilderness area. The point where the child disappeared is extremely dense with 
rhododendron, and laurel thicket, and it is generally conceded by all concerned that unless the child responded vocally, persons could pass within feet of the child and never find him. There's a, there's a paragraph further down on page 10 that states, The Knoxville office since the time of the child's disappearance has conducted inquiries to establish the location of two individuals of questionable reputation who may have been in the area of the child's disappearance. It was established that neither had been present in the National Park when the boy disappeared. Additionally, one individual has been interviewed who reportedly heard a scream during the pertinent period. However, investigation revealed the scream was in an area other than where the child disappeared. We are currently attempting we are currently attempting to identify an individual who resides in Kentucky as a result of an anonymous letter received at the Knoxville office stating that he had been in the park and has a boy about seven years old. Strange that someone would submit an anonymous letter um, about someone being a person of interest, but that appears to be what happened. The FBI, obviously, you can see in the records, they were getting annoyed with the father. They kept telling people, including the father of Dennis, that they weren't investigating yet you can see in the files they're actually they actually were investigating they were following up with various leads um, on page 12 you can see some of that frustration come out in the third paragraph they write the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of the seven-year-old child in a remote area of the great smoky mountains national park indicate that this boy simply became lost in this vast wilderness in the late afternoon torrential rains set in around nightfall which continued for two days thereafter Due to the extremely rugged terrain and the vastness of it, neither the child nor his body has ever been found. The father, William Martin, has been unwilling to accept the reality that his child did not survive and prefers to grasp at some hope that the child was kidnapped and taken from the park. There has been absolutely nothing to indicate this occurred. This kind of language in an FBI memo is really weird. Writing things like grasp at some hope is so weird. Uh, and it indicates that the FBI really didn't want to get involved. I don't think they wanted to have anything to do with this case. I think they were feeling sucked into it. They were identifying, they were getting leads sent to them anonymously. So they were getting drawn into it, but they didn't want to. And they felt like there wasn't a federal crime that took place. So they were trying to avoid it, yet you can see in these files that they were grudgingly staying involved. They mentioned in the last paragraph, the locality where the child disappeared is within the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And we would have investigated responsibility for any serious criminal offense that occurred in the park. Thus, because our responsibility under the kidnapping statute, we have from the inception maintained close liaison with the park service in connection with the disappearance of this child. Both as a cooperative measure with the Park Service and in protecting our own interests, we have from time to time con conducted very limited inquiry in order to resolve any possibility of foul play. Cur on the next page, page 13, during the course of the search, an individual named blank of questionable reputation seemed unduly curious and was a constant bystander at principal points of, oper of operation to the point Park Service official became suspicious of his motives. We discreetly established that Blank had not been present in the park on the day of disappearance of the child. It's very frustrating they blank the names, but I know they do this usually if the person is still alive when they've declassified the file, they have to, uh, they have to blank out the names. On July 21, 1969, five weeks after Dennis's disappearance, Blank of Carthage, Tennessee, notified the press that he had he had been in the park on the day the child disappeared and had heard a scream late in the afternoon and thereafter got a glimpse of a man moving through underbrush. Blank was not well acquainted with the park and he was not sure where he was in relation to Spence Field from which the child disappeared. Arrangements were made to have Blank accompany an agent to the park. In the park, Blank note pointed out to an agent and a park ranger the exact location where he was standing when he heard the scream. This point is at such a distance from the point where the child disappeared that in the opinion of rangers familiar with the park and considering the time element involved, it would not have been possible for the scream to have had any connection with the disappearance of a child of the child. What's interesting about that is that I don't know, most light, I mean, maybe it was circumstantial, maybe it was a coincidence that he heard a scream on the same exact day. Um, a lot of people will report things that are totally unrelated to a missing child case when it becomes, you know, public and a lot of people hear about it. So it's possible that it was a coincidence. It's just very strange that that witness account occurred at the same time. 
Page 14 is the first note the, of the FBI being aware that William Martin, the father of Dennis Martin, had been reaching out to uh, psychics. And this isn't the first time that FBI records show skepticism against um, psychics and people like that. Uh, the wording of this last paragraph on page 14 is kind of reveals their feelings about that form of investigation. They write, we have consistently declined to conduct any investigation for William Martin based on the many visions and insights, insights and in quotes of cranks and others that have contacted the Martin family. That's not entirely true. <clears throat> Further on, you'll see that there was an investigation to follow up on one particular psychic vision page 17 that they again notified the father that they would not be investigating that they're not investigating there has not been any proof of any kind of kidnapping or crime so i'm kind of scrolling through a lot of these that are repetitive the father i don't know if he had a lot of money or pull but he got into contact with congressman john duncan and john duncan on july 18th 1969 uh, sent a letter to the FBI. On July 16th, he mentions that the father, accompanied by his wife, Violet Hanley Martin, went to the FBI office in Knoxville, and the memo writer talked to them. Mr. Martin stated that since his child, Dennis Martin, had not been found by the searching party, he believed that the child had been kidnapped, and he requested that the FBI enter the case and conduct a full investigation on this basis. Again, he kept on going back to the FBI and asking them to investigate. I explained to Mr. Martin that in the absence of specific information indicating a kidnapping and the absence of uh, that any foul play had befallen the child, the FBI, the FBI would not undertake a full investigation. Again, they just keep on turning him down and turning him down. They would not, uh, they would not investigate it as a kidnapping. Nothing to indicate foul play. I tend to disagree later on, and I'm surprised the FBI didn't eventually open an investigation considering the evidence that was uncovered later in this um, in this investigation as they followed up on leads. I think they were particularly harsh toward any evidence that came up because they didn't seem to want to get involved, especially as the years went on. Some of the evidence was pretty shocking, and the FBI still uh, just kind of brushed it aside and ignored it, which uh, it gets really interesting in the later years, not in the 60s, but as we get into the 70s. Poor family. I mean, the poor William Martin and his wife were just trying everything they could to get the FBI to get involved. Someone to care enough to search, to conduct a criminal investigation about this disappearance. I think he was convinced that his son was abducted and not swept away in a stream or something. Um, this is, I don't know if this is out there. I think a lot of people already knew this probably. Reading through these files, I never realized Dennis Martin had developmental issues. Uh, until I read this paragraph on page 30 that said, It is to be noted also Dennis Martin this past year was sent to special school for children with emotional difficulties and low learning ability. They didn't say why that was relevant. I think they found that was relevant in saying it wasn't foul play. I think that made them think it was more likely that Dennis had disappeared, had slipped, had made a mistake, got lost just because... He didn't know how to find his way back or something. I'm pretty sure the FBI was convinced that he had died and that the father wouldn't um, wouldn't accept that. Although, again, in later years, there are some facts that come out that make that a little less likely. And it's very, again, it's very weird the FBI did not open the case. People with developmental issues were seen as less lower members of society as a kind way to put it and it was it was terrible there were institutions where they were treated like garbage and i think this is kind of a reflection of the social attitude toward this child because he's uh learned he was learning disabled and it's really scary to see this where they're just like oh he's dead whatever the father just needs to accept it and i think the father sensed that people really weren't caring as much as they probably would have otherwise okay here's where things get creepy <laughs> Um, again, I've always been skeptical of psychics and clairvoyance. There are some cases where things have turned up or they've turned up things that are kind of related but unrelated. They're never very specific. They'll never say X object is in location Y and you find that object there. 
they're very vague. And then if you happen to find something, people circumstantially say, oh, they predicted it. This is one of those cases where the clairvoyant doesn't accurately say the object that was found, but point them in the right direction, which is creepy as hell, honestly. Um, but this is on page 41 uh, in the FBI vault. A memorandum dated, this is on, um, now we're now into October 7th, 1969, couple mo- a few months after the disappearance. For the information of the lab, William Martin, father of Dennis Martin, advised 10469 that blank, who claims to be endowed with extrasensory perception, advised him that she knew that there was a cabin with a porch in the area of Spence Field and that she could see some shiny object <clears throat> in the far left corner as one faces the cabin. So far left corner, a shiny object. That was her prediction. Martin and Mr. Blank, Great Smoky Mountains National Park Ranger supervisor, went up to Spence Field and determined that the cabin seen by this clairvoyant in her vision could be none other than the old hiker's shelter which is located at Spence Field. Martin crawled under a bunk in the left corner of the shelter and under a rock found the enclosed shorts. So, yeah, that is weird. Oh, I'm just going to continue. Uh, it is impossible for anyone to have dropped these shorts in that particular place in so much as there is no room between the wall and the bunk to do so, so that it was under a rock. Like someone intentionally put these shorts under the rock to hide them. Creepy. Unfortunately, they have they, they put these stupid stamps over the text, so it's really hard to read. Uh, the lab is requested to attempt to determine the brand name of these shorts and also attempt to determine the laundry marks which may be contained on these shorts. Unfortunately, this is 1969. I'm sure DNA isn't that great, so they couldn't do a whole lot of DNA testing, I don't think, at this time. So they were at least trying to figure out the brand name of the shorts, laundry marks, or whatever they could use to determine um, any identification. Last paragraph, in so much as there appear to be stains on the shorts, the lab is requested to determine the nature of these stains. The lab is also requested to advise the Knoxville division if there is any way through which it may may be determined as to how long these particular shorts had lain where they were found. That's interesting. Not a shiny object. Again, it's totally not specific. But the, the details about the shorts indicate that they could be Dennis Martin's. They were a small child's. Um, it's just really strange. So the lab results that came back, uh, page 43, results of examination. The Q1 undershorts are badly deteriorated and are about the size worn by a small child. No visible or invisible cleaners or laundry marks were found on Q1. It was not possible to determine the source or brand of Q1, nor how long Q1 could have been at the site where it was found. No hairs or fibers were count or found on Q1. No blood was identified on specimen Q1. Basically, the lab report was useless. And if you look at the attachments, they vaguely mention uh, on page 46 uh, some reddish stains, but apparently nothing further. So they couldn't, I don't think they could determine anything from the stains. This whole part of the story blows my mind because it indicates that the FBI knew there were shorts the size worn by Dennis Martin, located at an area where he had disappeared, hidden under a rock. It just blows my mind that they, that that wouldn't at least elevate their interest in, in saying, hey, this may actually be foul play. Um, this is a piece of evidence that indicates there could be foul play here, and they didn't do that. I think it was a sign of the times. They were less interested in the story because... Um, it was about a child with devel- developmental disability, and uh, maybe, I think it's just, I th- honestly think that had uh, a part to play in this whole thing. My phone is acting like a little bitch right now, so I'm going to switch over to my GoPro, and when my computer finishes loading, I'm going to continue on. Uh, technology. If I had more subscribers, I could afford to upgrade. <laughs> uh, I might edit that out. Okay, this is this is where it gets really interesting. November. Now this is November fifteenth, nineteen seventy-eight. This is almost ten years later. This is where the later years information. I had never heard about this stuff. This is just fascinating stuff. And this is in our local area here. 
So this, okay, I'll just read it. Uh, on November 15th, 1978, Blunt County, Tennessee Sheriff L.B. Sutton of Maryville, Tennessee, telephonically advised that Blank, protected identity, told Sheriff Sutton that Blank was informed by FNU, um, I don't know what FNU is, that Blank had kidnapped Dennis Martin in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and sold Martin to an unknown individual Blank, so the name was actually provided. Sutton advised that he had been Blunt County Sheriff in 1967 or 68 when the incident occurred, and Sutton remembered it. Sutton further advised he called the record center at Blank and confirmed that during the period, Blank was incar incarcerated. Uh, it's so many blanks, it's hard to make out what they're saying here. Here's the next paragraph. Sheriff Sutton further stated that although Blank at the time of Dennis Martin's disappearance... He knew several key factors about the case, which caused Sutton to believe Blank's story. So the person claiming to have kidnapped Dennis knew fa some key factors about the case. I don't know if these are factors that were in, in, in the news, so he would have known. We've got pages and pages of blanked out documents in between that previous one and this one, which is page 94. There were photos, there was all kinds of stuff. There was a handwritten letter that was in, indiscernible. Um, but this is what happens with a lot of government records when the when government agencies sometimes release documents via Freedom of Information Act. A ton of really useful, probably the most important information is completely blanked out. So you have to make sense of incomplete information, which is really frustrating. But finally, all the way back, all the way down in, in um, on page 94, dated November 20, 1978, again, almost 10 years after the disappearance. Uh, someone had been identified who was incarcerated, having admitted that they had kidnapped Dennis Martin. And I believe it, this document here is one of the special agents had interviewed this person, a person who knew that person but it's hard to tell i'll read it and try to make sense of it uh, blank protected identity formerly of blank was interviewed at blank where he was incarcerated he initially requested complete confidentiality in the following matter stating he did not wish his name to be made public to any non-fbi individual he then voluntarily furnished the following information complete paragraph blanked complete paragraph blanked next page on November 16th, 1978, Blank advised that Blank, he was told by Blank and Blank that Blank had kidnapped seven-year-old boy Dennis Martin from Great Smoky Mountain National Park and sold him to a man given the name Blank, provided details allegedly told him by Blank, which appears a resemblance to the mysterious disappearance of Dennis Lloyd Martin, date of birth, June 20, 1962, from Spence Field, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, near Gatlinburg, Tennessee, on June 14, 1969. County Sheriff L.B. Dutton received telephone information regarding blank incarcerated at blank between blank. So this was someone informing on someone else who was incarcerated that that person had admitted to kidnapping Dennis Martin, essentially. Uh, the Bureau is requested to search their indices and furnish Knoxville with the Xerox copies of any reports, documents, and other information in the file concerning Dennis Lloyd Martin, missing person, uh, June 14, 1969. So they're calling up all the old records of Dennis Martin and kind of reopening the case at this point. They were also looking for will contact prison officials to determine information regarding any blank incarcerated there during the period ending October 1978. In particular periods of incarceration, descriptions and last known addresses or parole information is requested. So they're looking for this person who someone else had informed, made this comment that he had, while he was in prison, had claimed he had kidnapped Dennis Martin. Okay, are you ready for this? Because this is going to get really funny really fast. And then it'll get really interesting really fast. The next page, page 97, is hilarious. There's one memo <laughs> uh, dated November 30, 1978 that says, A review of bureau indices fails to disclose any record concerning Dennis Lloyd Martin, born 6 <laughs> And there's underneath, handwritten, a question mark, exclamation point, someone screwed up really bad, searched the indices, and couldn't even find any of Dennis Martin's records, which... 
obviously existed. We just went through almost 100 pages of them. So, um, and then it, on the bottom it says reassigned to whatever. So it was just a, a clerical error that got recorded in the memo. Um, it was hilarious. But anyway, next page. They go on with this investigation of this person. On November 16, 1978, Blank advised that Blank, um, he was told had kidnapped Dennis Martin from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and sold him to a man, again, the same name. This is almost a duplicate of the previous document. Leads sent to Bureau requested they search indices for any information on Lloyd Martin. Uh, NGIC and TIES searched for blank fitting the description. So they're on a hunt now for this guy to find where he is, where he is incarcerated. Uh, and then they, there's a quick note on page 99 where they say, upon receipt of information, from Nashville, a uh, new case agent can make determinations to whether he should be interviewed regarding his activities during the period 1969 when Dennis Lloyd Martin became missing. It is realized that without an admission by a subject, it would be virtually impossible to prove kidnapping after 10 years. Not really true if you have DNA, but anyway. Uh, however, due to the nature of the case and the similarity in blank stories, and the facts of the matter, it was decided that the case should be opened for at least preliminary investigation. So they reopened, in 1978, they reopened Dennis's, Dennis Martin's case. I'm not sure how, much, how public information that is, but it's interesting that they reopened it because there was this potential person who had admitted uh, actually kidnapping and selling him. Uh, they had a response from one facility. After searching her files, she ascertained only two individuals by that name have ever been confined to that institution. A bunch of information blanked out. She also advised that a bunch of blank information. Um, again, frustrating because they, you can't get the whole story. So much is blanked out, but you can get enough to kind of piece things together. Okay, page 102 is interesting because it further confirms the claim. This is dated March 28, 1979. So now we're approaching the 10 year anniversary of Dennis Martin's disappearance. On March 28, 1979, the writer discussed the facts of this case with Special Agent Blank. After reviewing the case, Special Agent advised that if the information provided by the person regarding the other person stealing Martin from the park and selling him is accurate, this is a state kidnapping violation and therefore is also a CGR kidnapping violation. If the man to whom Blank sold Martin took Martin interstate, both that person and the man who bought Martin are subject to federal kidnapping charges. So now they're realizing they may potentially be in their jurisdiction. They may actually have to open this case as a real kidnapping investigation 10 years after the fact, which has to be embarrassing if you think about it, the fact that they just waited 10 years for this to fall on their lap and then finally start investigating it as, an, as a, a kidnapping. Uh, we'll obtain photographs of blank and blank discreetly display photographs to blank to see if he can make a positive identification with the individual who took who told him the story about stealing a young boy in the Smoky Mountain National Park in 1969. Oh, the, so what they were doing is the informant told them that this other person had said he had stolen, um, he had he had kidnapped Dennis Martin. And so what they were going to do is take, discreetly take or obtain photographs of this person who supposedly kidnapped Dennis and show it to the informant to see if he could actually positively identify the, that person. Because obviously if he can't identify him, then his claim is false. Next page, they obtained photographs of the person who was alleged to have kidnapped Dennis. 12 photographs. It took until August to do this entire investigation, this piece of the investigation. I don't know why it would take that long, but um, on August, the person identified the photograph of the person who he was alleging had kidnapped, identified a photograph of blank who told him the story concerning the kidnapping of caption subject. So he successfully identified the person he was informing on. So he obviously knows the person. Uh, next page, investigation by Knoxville has developed blank as a suspect in the abduction of Martin. And then a full description, which they've completely blanked out. Uh, Bureau is requested to furnish Knoxville with arrest record for that person. So now it's getting interesting. They actually have the name of a person who has allegedly admitted to having kidnapped Dennis Martin in 1969 to another uh, prison inmate. So this person who's working with the FBI now and is an informant saying this other inmate had, had admitted he had kidnapped Dennis Martin uh, agreed to the polygraph test. 
Um, he was so cooperative with the FBI. This was the statement made on uh, page 114. This is uh, dated October 3, 1979. On 9-25-79, Blank advised he would be, t in quotes, too happy to take a polygraph examination on caption matter. He also stated he would testify in court. Keep that in mind as we go through these files and you get to the end of what the FBI eventually determined on this. This guy was so adamant that he was telling the truth. That this other person had told him he had kidnapped Dennis Martin. That he was working with the FBI. This is a this is a prison inmate, mind you, working with FBI agents, willing to take a polygraph that the guy actually told him this and, and was willing to testify in court. I'll just keep that in mind. Okay, so what the FBI do next on the next few pages, you can kind of watch the 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 progression of this investigation is they decide they've they've pulled all the arrest records all the all the information about this person who supposedly abducted dennis martin they have all of his arrest records they have all they're building a case basically to try this guy and the last thing they want to do is get corroborating information from other inmates at the prison he's currently incarcerated in. You, on another page they mention, hey, if he was talking to this other guy who's cooperating with us and admitted that he had kidnapped Dennis Martin, then clearly he's got to be talking to other inmates too, where he's at right now. And so they identified some associates, some friends of this guy in the prison he was in. Um, they picked one of them out, and this is on page 120. On January 16, 1980, um, Blank Clerk, Central Records Section, Tennessee State Bureau of Corrections, conducted a search of her records and advised that Blank and Blank were incarcerated in the Tennessee prison system at whatever the location was. On the same date, this is crazy, inmate number Blank advised he was an associate of inmate Blank. He stated that he is very well acquainted with Blank and that he is a compulsive liar. He stated that he has related many stories to him concerning past exploits, but has never mentioned anything about the kidnapping or murder of a young boy. So here's a, a friend of this inmate who supposedly admitted in another prison that he had abducted Den Dennis Martin, and now they found an inmate in his current prison who's saying, you can only really look at it one way, he's trying to protect his friend from getting in trouble. I can't think of any other any other alternative, only because the first guy in the other prison had been, again, this is an inmate. For them to cooperate with the FBI, to actually work with agents, with federal agents, and be willing to go in front of a judge, in front of a court, and testify that he heard this guy say this, it goes against the idea of this guy just making up a story about this other person. Okay, so in the next part of this investigation, the FBI tracked down this person who supposedly claimed he had kidnapped Dennis Martin. Um, they had to go to his parole officer, get his address. They went there, interviewed his wife. His wife didn't know where he was at the time, only that he was living with his parents. He was unemployed. And eventually they found the guy. They, on page 130, they started the interview. Uh, blank, presently unemployed, was interviewed in the presence of his former wife concerning information on his possible involvement with the kidnapping of a young boy by the name of Dennis Lloyd Martin from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and selling Martin to an unknown person. <clears throat> he advised that while he was an inmate in the blank, an associate as well as fellow inmate had approached him and informed him that he had been interviewed by the FBI concerning his blank involvement with the kidnapping of a child from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He stated that he considered his blank to be a habitual liar and he attempted to verify his story by contacting the guard on duty. However, the guard informed him that his records did not show anyone from the FBI having interviewed him. He advised he assumed that Blank had told him the story about the FBI and kidnapping the child in order to get him in trouble with the other inmates. He stated this conversation with Blank took place approximately, however, it's blanked out. He assumed that Blank created the story for pure vindictiveness on his part due to the fact that most inmates that most inmates view the harming of a child as being a crime against them personally. He noted that if a person has committed a crime against a child, he normally will be treated with some animosity. He advised Blank was thought to have and Blank, and he personally did not trust him. This inmate is saying, is claiming, informant who is cooperating with the FBI 
only told that story to get the other person in trouble because inmates view the harming of a child to be a crime against them personally and they're usually treated pretty poorly but again it sounds contrived again this other guy i can't see him getting contacted by the fbi and actually not folding and saying i made it up and agreeing to actually testify in court about it he added that he <laughs> doing his own investigation allegedly he added that he was determined that Blank had told other prisoners about the situation. However, he was able to convince other inmates that Blank was lying on him and wanted to make trouble for him. He stated he thought Blank had told other inmates, but he could not recall their names. So it's this whole he said, she said thing. Uh, he advised the only time he has been anywhere near Great Smoky Mountains was during July 1976, and he was escorted by his wife. And it, what it boils down to really is that this guy, this other guy who is working with the FBI and willing to testify in court that this this inmate who they're interviewing now admitted that he had kidnapped dennis martin now when the fbi is in his face and saying so what's this story all about he's saying oh he made that up because he wants to get me in trouble he wanted the other inmates to hate me he has something against me blah blah, blah. that was his story um this is all on one page on page 130 toward the end of the fbi file this is this guy defending himself against these against what he himself supposedly had had been telling the story he had been telling <sighs> so end of the file how does this all end so i believe at that point the fbi dropped that whole thread of the investigation i i think they believe the second inmate no further investigation which in my mind is crazy there's no other files related to that whole story the last two documents are really strange this is all the way in january 22 1981 many many years after the abduction someone told the fbi names blanked out blank stated on january 21 1980 he and other individuals were talking about this boy and he received information that blank who works at blank in knox county knew where subject martin was he stated that martin was alive and well he stated he would help any way he could if a special agent would contact blank asked that his name be kept confidential next page and this is the very last page of the fbi files on dennis martin on january 23 1981 blank was contacted regarding information he had furnished to special agent on january 22 1981 regarding captioned matter he stated that he overheard blank say that subject martin was alive and well blank who works at blank did not however say where martin was living on Jan january 22 1981 he was contacted uh, blank was contacted at his place of employment and advised he knew nothing about the martin boy and obtained his information from a neighbor of his this is whole like neighbors talking gossip that's what this seems to be all about they finally got the name of the neighbor who told this guy he knew martin was alive and well uh, blank was thereafter the neighbor was was thereafter telephonically contacted in an attempt to obtain directions to his residence and set an appointment for an interview at that time Blank was informed as to the purpose of the interview, but stated he had never heard of Dennis Lloyd Martin and could provide no information as to Martin's current whereabouts. In March, on March 26, 1981, Blank was again contacted at his place of employment. Um, so the FBI didn't give up. On March, they went back to the original person who said his neighbor had said this about Martin, Dennis Martin. Um, and this guy said on march 26 1981 blank was again contacted at his place of employment and he stated he is positive blank his neighbor is the individual who provided the information about martin blank stated that the neighbor who is approximately blank years old used to live in georgia and had claimed that martin was living with relatives in that area blank is of the opinion that martin was never forcibly taken from the park and that relatives were involved for some unknown reason Blank, who advised that Blank lives in a remote area of Blank, agreed to point out his residence so that he may be interviewed at a future date. Last file. The last file ends with some dude claiming that Dennis Martin is actually still alive, at least as of March 1981. I, so the whole case of Dennis Martin, if you look it up on Wikipedia, is like this kid got lost there was a massive search the father got in touch with psychics and some there was a reward out there all of this information was so outside the bounds of what i 
ever could have imagined happened after the disappearance. From 1969 all the way up through 1981, someone in prison claiming that he had abducted Martin and then coming up with an excuse once the FBI actually confronted him about it. And then to end with this weird claim that Dennis Martin is actually alive. It's almost like an Elvis sighting or something. I don't know, it's just really weird. Such a convoluted line throughout the years, uh, the investigation that took place by the FBI that nobody knew about until 2022 is just so crazy. It's so much interesting information. And in my opinion, it kind of hints that the case was not as cut and dry as people thought. He was probably abducted for some reason. Uh, but then there's this nagging thought in the back of my mind, the fact that there was that shoeless footprint, the fact that he had been playing with other kids at the campground. And you know how kids treat other kids, or at least back then especially, how they treated other kids with developmental issues. Um, maybe they pushed him into the water and they just never told anyone what had happened because they were, you know, they were bullying him or, or just treating him horribly and the poor kid, maybe he died and who knows so hard to know but there are so many more leads that took place following that disappearance that nobody had ever really known about if you have never seen these files just go to the fbi vault search for dennis martin you'll see the the, the complete 133 documents it's fascinating to read through unfortunately the case was never solved and probably never will be solved even though there are all these leads out there that I think someone could potentially follow up on and um, find out who did it if somebody did do it. But anyway, hope you enjoyed this journey into the past, this crazy story, this crazy sad story about this disappearance of Dennis Lloyd Martin. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time.